Hey, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's event with the one and only Dr. Tom Arnold, and he will be discussing battling astigmatism. So I'll be your host tonight. My name is Dr. Ariel Sorenzi. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, though he probably doesn't need an introduction. Uh, so he is a graduate from the University Houston College of Optometry. And he is a world-renowned speaker, uh, very passionate about contact lenses, uh, scleral lenses, and he is a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society, an associate member of the International Society of Contact Lens Specialists. He is also a co-chair for the International Congress of Scleral Contact Lens Meeting, which is a international meeting that um, is a great meeting to attend to. I went last year and it was it was amazing. So we're getting to hear from a, a expert in this field and we are so happy to have him join us tonight. Here are his financial disclosures, all of which have been mitigated. So I'm gonna go ahead and have you take it from here, Dr. Arnold. <clears throat> Thank you, Ariel. It's great to see you. And thanks to all the staff um, at Wu University for having me. I, I'm very much looking forward to this. Uh, I, get, I put my disclosures in here. I think the picture is a little better. But uh, anyway, so astigmatism, right? So you have someone in your chair and you make the diagnosis. You say, oh, by the way, you have some astigmatism. And there's those pa those patients that kind of freak out that astigmatism, they hear that they're going blind. You know, this, this is something really bad. They have the stigma. Uh, and and so it's your job to, to explain this to them. And, you know, uh, we talk about astigmatism and you're, everybody on this call tonight is an optometrist or an eye care practitioner, or ophthalmologist. And you go, why do I need something on astigmatism? You know, we, we know what that is. But um, I was talking to Don Ezekiel in a podcast a couple of years ago, and he said, there's always something extra you can do. There's always something a little more uh, that we can do for our patients. And uh, I love this quote from the great you know, physicist, Dr. Stephen Hawking, that, you know, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. So I always like to keep an open mind and, and open to, to some new facet of learning. But astigmatism is pretty straightforward. We have two focal points, uh, not on the retina, separated by, by some distance. And the first question we need to ask is, you know, astigmatism, you know, where is it? You know, where is this astigmatism? Is it anterior? Is it posterior? Maybe it's internal, you know, lenticular, lenticular, or maybe something, something a, a combination, which usually it is. And then again, what is it? Is it myopic? Is it hyperopic? Is it mixed astigmatism? Uh, is it irregular or asymmetrical? So it, it bears it bears some analysis of we have astigmatism. You know what, what are we dealing with here? Now back when I started, you know, in the early '80s, uh, we we didn't have a lot of tools. Uh, we had keratometry. Uh, we looked at Myers and we rotated a drum and and tried to align the Myers and. Um, if we didn't get a clear image, if it was distorted, and that was one uh, clue for us. Uh, and of course, we always have retinoscopy, uh, where we look for irregular reflexes, the so-called scissors reflex. And I know in this age of um, automated, you know, refractometry and all the combination instruments we have, you know, sometimes we don't pick up retinoscopes uh, like we used to. But in the case of of something that's irregular, suspicious, I urge you to pick up your retinoscope and put them behind the phoropter and uh, see what's going on with that reflex. And in the last, last few years, uh, topography has, of course, made a lot of inroads. It measures a larger surface than the keratometer, uh, but it's still limited to the anterior surface. And the kind of maps we get out of uh, topography are, the, are axial and tangential and elevation maps. And I want to spend a little time on that. So we need to keep in mind that every patient is unique. Um, I, I like art and I like Picasso's painting and he has all sorts of strange eyes uh, in, his, in his facial profiles. And so what would he do? If it's, if it's pure corneal astigmatism and that equals your refractive astigmatism, then you know, we might, might be thinking about corneal uh, gas variable lenses. On the other hand, if we have 
corneal stigmatism and it doesn't uh, line up with the refraction, then we might be talking about some sort of soft lens, soft toric lens. And then in cases where you have essentially spherical corneas, um, but you have refractive astigmatism, then we have to th look a little deeper. Is it posterior? Is it lenticular? Uh, and so it bears a little watching. And so three simple examples of this that are something we encounter every day. The first example is you have refractive astigmatism, pretty much uh, lines up with corneal astigmatism in terms of uh, axis and power. And so it's it's confined to the cornea. So we might consider, you know, gas probable lenses, you know, in that situation. And the other obvious example is that you have, you know, a, a fair amount of refractive astigmatism in the prescription, but you have almost a spherical cornea. So then you have to think, at least on the anterior part, so where is it, you know, is it internal, either, either posterior or lenticular? And in that case, it's a pretty easy um, jump to put on a soft torque lens if needed. And then you have cases what I call crazy town, where you have high degrees of astigmatism, uh, may or may not line up with the keratometry readings. You know, something's off. And if you see, uh, like in the bottom map here, let me see if I can get rid of this. Try to get rid of this little guy here. No, can't do it. Anyway, if you look on the very bottom right map, on this uh, tomogram, then you can see that a lot of the uh, a lot of the curvature changes in ectasias on the posterior surface. So this would be a, a case of keratoconus and a scleral lens, as we see in in the illustration, might be appropriate. So I want to spend a, a few minutes on maps. So we're familiar with axial maps and tangential maps. And the thing to keep in mind with both of these is that these are maps of curvature change, of power change. Uh, an axial map measures all the curves using one radius, and then a tangential map has an individual radius for each, each particular curve. And so it's really the same information. Uh, the tangential maps are just busier. And if you're dealing with a laboratory, some prefer one over the other, but they're really giving you the same information. And the important part to, for me here is that this is not the shape of the cornea. This is the power of the cornea. We're not fitting something here. And we're used to, especially in cases uh, where we deal with a lot of keratoconus, we're used to showing people, uh, our patients, you know, illustrations of cone-shaped corneas you know, that look like a missile end. That's not what you're seeing here, right? And that's important to keep in mind. When we fit contacts, we're fitting the corneal surface. And the a best description of that, in my opinion, or, or a very important description, is the elevation map. Okay. The elevation map shows the highs and lows of the cornea uh, compared to a best fit sphere. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And the thing is, the, the coloration of these maps are different. That is, the blue area, which we associate with flatter areas in an axial map, that's actually the steeper area here. That's below the best fit sphere. Uh, and then the warmer colors, the, the oranges and reds, those are elevations above the best fit sphere. So this is really what we're going to fit in any kind of contact uh, that we're considering. And so I, I, I like the uh, how this picture lines up with it. You can see the actual cone in this, in this case, keratoconus. Uh, where the elevation is, and it matches uh, the elevation map uh, quite well. And then the other thing we have that has become uh, more available in the last few years is tomography. Tomography is, you know, capturing, uh, uh, creating a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional solid object, as in, as in the cornea. And the main advantage of tomography is that it measures the overall corneal thickness, is in the bottom left uh, picture there, and not only the anterior elevation, but the posterior elevation. And many studies now show us that in the case of keratoconus, uh, the ectasia begins on the posterior surface and then advances you know, up, up towards the front. Uh, and so we can kind of see what's going on anteriorly and posteriorly uh, on these corneas. So what is Scheinflug, um, essentially? Scheinflug is uh, an imaging system where um, when we don't have it, 
the the lens plane, the image plane, and the subject plane do not line up. They do not intersect. And so the image is poor. It it it, it vignettes off or gets more uh, blurred towards uh, the edges. What Scheinflug did, did is that he oriented the image plane uh, to focus on, to intersect the subject plane along with the lens. So they come to a point called the Scheinflug intersection, where everything is in focus. Scheinflug was an interesting guy. He was uh, Theodore Scheinflug was in the Austrian army before World War II, World War I. And his job was to fly above the enemy lines and photograph it and photograph all the trenches and the troop movements. And he found out as he's flying above you know, the ground and the earth is, is falling away in all directions, the, the image quality was not good. So he developed this system you know, before the First World War. This is a picture of one of his early cameras. Uh, unfortunately, he, he died quite young but we uh, benefit from this technology. One of the things that we can get out of tomography um, is, is something called uh, the Bell and Ambrosio you know, um, enhanced ectasia. Uh, these two ophthalmologists developed a, a system where they normalize the, the corneal elevation. And what, what that means is that when we do elevation maps, we look towards uh, a best fit sphere. But if we have areas of ectasia, then when, when creating a best fit sphere, the areas of flat, flatter areas look steeper and the steeper areas look flatter. It smooths everything out. You don't get a true picture. So if you can see the illustration on the lower right. What they've done is they take the, the four, three to four millimeters, the most ectatic area of the cornea, exclude it and create a best fit sphere, excluding that very ectatic area. So what that does is it lets the, the area of ectasia, ectasia really pop out and you can see, um, uh, see the, the difference there, the, the true nature of the ectasia. And along the bottom right of the, of the slide uh, of the, on the left side, you see little values down there. Those are uh, standard deviations from normal. And there's standard deviations from the front curvature, the back curvature, the overall thickness. And, and they come up with an, an algorithm that gives us something called a D value. And anything larger than three is suspicious for keratoconus. So very, very useful maps. And we'll, we'll visit that again in a minute. But lots of times we can take care of even corneal stigmatism with soft contact lenses. Um, and everybody tonight is familiar with the standard offerings from um, all the major manufacturers, which are quite good, and, and they've improved greatly. But sometimes when you have these very, very ectatic uh, corneas, high, high astigmatism, um, high powers, then we need something um, a little bit more customized. So we have a variety of um, soft lens um, custom lenses uh, with a wide range of diameters and base curves and extended range powers. And we can really dial in and, and make a lens that fits our patients um, to the best of our ability. So this is an example just from, from one lab of all the different parameters we can get. You know, we can get from 6.9 to 9.5 millimeter base curves, diameters from 12 to 16, all these different power ranges. And these are made to order uh, exactly to the patient. So it's nice that we have these you know, in, our, in our toolbox. And the way one of the nomograms here from just one company is it's based on your um, keratometry readings, your, your, your base curve, your flat, flattest K. And then you intersect that, you take that line vertically up to the, there's three different plastics uh, from this lab. And where that intersects, that gives you the base curve. So you have the base curve and the overall diameter uh, of, of the lens. And all you do then is uh, just put in the, the prescription as, as required. And they're, like I said, they're made to order. And a variation of this would be actually what we call soft cone lenses. Um, and these are very similar to what I just described, but they tend to be thicker. So they mask the the ectasias you know, a lot more, more. They mask it better and hide hide that ectasia. 
The downside to lenses like these is that they're, they do this by thickening the lens and therefore cutting down the oxygen. So the, you know, the D, DK over T is, is not very good with these lenses. So you have to be real cautious of what's going on in the endothelium and make sure there's no fuchs uh, dystrophy going on or any kind of compromise to oxygen. Certainly want to, you know, watch for neovascularization and, and all those things. But they are available in very, very small increments, and they certainly do have a place when we we encounter these patients. And here's here's a patient that that um, fits this bill that that I fit, where he definitely had keratoconus. He you can see he has almost four diopters of astigmatism. His K max is fifty four. His prescription's not all that uh, exotic. It's not all that high. But, it, but now, again, we're, we're returning to the elevation maps. And you can see here that the elevations on the front of this eye are, are very are quite minimal. There's only about a 50 micron difference between the high and the low points on this. So the ectasia is all on the back surface. And this is something that tomography you know, describes to us. And so this gentleman did very, very well in what we call a custom cone lens. Uh, that drapes over this essentially spherical um, anterior corneal surface, but it still has the, the astigmatism correction in the cylinder uh, to take care of the posterior astigmatism. So again, keep it in mind when you see you have astigmatism and you can quantify where the astigmatism is, as we, as we talked about earlier. Um, and if you have a essentially spherical uh, anterior surface, then you'd be thinking a soft lens. But let's pause for a minute and talk about in praise of corneal gas perm lenses. And these are these are appropriate and should be considered when you know the corneal cylinder is approximately equal to the refractive cylinder. Uh, they can be manufactured to correct a very high degree of astigmatism. They're less expensive. You know, they're easier to maintain uh, and they give excellent visual acuity. Uh, guys my age remember that when I, I first got contact lenses when I was 12 years old because I had a, a very progressive myopia and all, all lenses were hard. <laughs> if you wanted to wear a contact lens, it was a small piece of plastic. So I think, you know, with the you know, profusion of soft lenses, we don't think about RGPs as much as we should. Uh, but but they certainly have a place. Um, in cases where you do have corneal astigmatism on the order of two and a half diopters or more, then you're probably going to be fitting a bitoric lens uh, in that to align to both those curves. And that's with topography now, it's very easy to do. So here's a case of, of a young man that was uh, referred to me for probable keratoconus. As you can see, he... Uh, he was a teenager, which is, you know, the age uh, where keratoconus really can progress in, in some individuals. And obviously, he had a very high, high amount of myopia, uh, a lot of astigmatism, poor vision. And he had, you know, he had elevated keratometry readings, but again, not crazy. He's not 60 or 70 uh, millimeters. Uh, his K-max was, was 49. So we did a little analysis, and this is where I went to the uh, Bell Ambrosio display, uh, which is very, very useful in these cases. And you can see that uh, on the left eye, on the, uh, the right side of the, the slide there, the left eye was really completely normal. All values were normal. The right eye on the left side there, the left, the left slide there, shows a little deviation in the anterior uh, curvature the anterior curvature, but it's it's just suspicious for keratoconus. It's not it's not keratoconus yet. Now at his age and with the suspicion, it may turn into keratoconus, but at this point it is it is not. And uh, so that's where these maps are are quite useful. And so if we go to the axial maps, we can see that we have you know a perfect bow tie or or you know dumbbell shape astigmatism. It's all in the cornea. It's all pretty much on the central cornea. So, so that, you know, really, that really gives us, uh, you know, an option. 
So going back to my good friend Picasso, what would what would he do? Well, I think Picasso would go for a Bitoric RGP in this case. So that's what we did. And you can see the, the base curves and the power uh, powers associated with each base curve in these lenses. And he saw very, very well. They centered very, very well. I will point out that I, I like the fit of the lens, the right lens, a little bit better than the left. Yeah, on the right lens, we can still see some iris detail. Uh, lens centers well. We have good apical, apical clearance. We don't have any areas of bearing. On the left eye, that's a little steep. Uh, and I probably would flatten that a little bit more. Uh, but he was very comfortable. He saw very well. Uh, and he saw 2025. And he was very happy. And, and he adapted you know, quite well. And you can fit RGPs uh, on a variety of eyes. These are this is one patient that had RK, and and uh, he was wearing these lenses, and he was referred to me by another practitioner for a scleral lens, because this particular individual was a hunter and uh, would be out be out outdoors and and shooting firearms and so forth, and he was afraid of losing his lenses, or I think he did lose them a couple of times, uh, so we wanted to fit him in a scleral, but. As we soon found out, he didn't see as well in the scleral. He saw a lot better in his corneal RGPs. So we just modified the fit so he had a little bit less movement. And he did quite well. Um, and actually, you know, for RK, we need to think about an RGP lens, either a corneal or a scleral, as the case may be, because soft lenses can certainly induce um, neovascularization in some of these wounds, because in some of these patients with RK, uh, the wounds never fully close, and so they're susceptible to neovascularization. So again, uh, we can we can fit these very successfully with an RGP. And one more case: uh, this gentleman had uh, scarring, I believe, from an injury, and so you can see his his axial map showed you know obviously a, a distortion. Look at his elevation map; we can see the areas of of where it's raised and where it's depressed. Um, the elevation map. And uh, I, I, I like this case a lot because you can see from the RGP, the, the fluorescein pattern under the lens pretty much aligns with the elevation map. So uh, again, my, my pitch for elevation maps is this will give you a good hint, uh, a good preview of how your lens is going to fit uh, on the eye. And, and uh, you can see the fluorescein pattern and the elevation pattern match quite well. So uh, again, it was a bitoric lens uh, to fit this, you know, eye that had, you know, five diopters of uh, corneal stigmatism. So after a while, you start looking at this stuff and uh, it becomes uh, uh, a little bit more intuitive to us all. So great. So what are the advantages of rigid gas parambol lenses? Uh, with topography now, we really fit them empirically. Uh, I don't trial fit uh, an irregular cornea with, with a rigid lens out of a kit because it's just going to be too far off. Uh, if you take a good map, have a good topographer, send it to the lab, your first lens is going to be quite close. It's going to have a very high success rate. Uh, many practitioners, many of my friends that do a lot of sclerals prefer corneal lenses for uh, penetrating keratoplasty uh, because, again, the, to avoid any uh, risk of neovascularization of, of that graft, especially in the early stages. Uh, patients may resist, you know, that adaptation period. We want to be satisfied now. We want it, we want it to feel good and see, see well, you know, from the start. But my advice to, to all of you is uh, to you know, prescribe boldly. You know, you're the expert. They're coming to you for your advice. Uh, we used to call it the power of the pen. Now, I know no one writes prescriptions with pens anymore. It's all EHR. But, you know, the, the phrase is you're the authority. You know, you're you're you know, you're the person that they come to to for advice and for, uh, you know, for success. Um, I really like uh, what my friend, Dr. Gary Gerber, came up with the four R's, where he says he repeats what, what the patient's concern are, what the patient's uh, problems are. 
he reviews the findings with the patient, goes over, you know, what what he's found in 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 the exam course of the exam. He recommends this is what, in my opinion, is the best thing for you, you know, you patient. And then he recalls, of course, he gets them back and and sees how they're doing and makes any modifications. So be be bold in these cases. You're the authority. Um, and and yeah, I think I'd use use that bully puppet as uh, uh, as Theodore Roosevelt used to say. But there's always a the middle ground. There's always a road to Middle Earth, so to speak. With apologies to uh, Tolkien. So um, and these are hybrids, of course. You know, we're talking about the new designs are now made with very high decay materials, both in the in the rigid part as well as the skirt. And now they have covalent bonding of the skirt to the to the RGP, the rigid center. And that pretty much uh, reduces or almost eliminates the separation and tearing that we experienced in you know earlier earlier versions. Um, it's really these are really excellent lenses when you want to fit an RGP, but centration is is difficult. Uh, or maybe move, you know, the excess movement would be would be a problem for people, and that that would be particularly so in cases where it's out outdoors, windy, dusty, where there's debris, or maybe strenuous physical activities, uh, sports activities, where you couldn't get an RGP, you know, to center well, or it may be lost. So they're quite good in, in these areas, and I think the biggest innovation is right here that the skirts now are designed to be linear rather than curved. Uh, numerous studies have shown us that once we get off the cornea, uh, the sclera becomes very, very tangent or straight. And so uh, now they manufacture these using HVID, the horizontal visible iris diameter, you know, as, as a metric. Um, and that the, the skirts now are straight, they're linear rather than curved. Uh, and the result is better centration and better comfort. So you can see, you know, on the on the right side here, um, as you go uh, along the HVIDs, that determines the angle of the skirt shown in purple. And, and you go from 38 to 49 uh, degrees of angle. Um, and if you look closely, you'll see the green curves uh, from the previous generation of flat, medium, and and steep. And so the problems that I used to experience was on the flat uh, skirts, you get fluting or the the edge, you know, stand standing up doing this. Uh, and on the steep one, it might just suck on. And so move removal of the lens uh, could have been a problem. But anyway, uh, they've gotten a lot better. So they certainly have a place in your toolbox. Uh, and if you haven't used them, I urge you to try some of these new designs. But, you know, uh, people like me, we're always thinking about sclerals. Uh, certainly, uh, Ken Pullum has. Uh, Ken's been doing this for more than 40 years at Moorfields Hospital in London, uh, has designed lenses and, and fit lenses uh, in all sorts of just really crazy, crazy and difficult cases. He even fit Tom Cruise and sclerals for some stunts he was doing in one of the Mission Impossible lenses. And uh, he's, uh, even during dinner, he's sketching out designs and uh, we're having a good time doing that. So when do you pick a scleral lens over a corneal RGP? Well, uh, Pat Caroline and uh, Randy Kojima at Pacific University uh, really looked at this a number of years ago, 2015, and what they did was they measured the elevation difference between uh, in the meridian of greatest curvature in, in that meridian. What is the elevation difference uh, in the most ectatic region? And they found that if that elevation difference was less than about 350 microns, then a, then a corneal lens could work and could work quite well. Uh, and subsequent studies that they presented this year uh, in 2023 at GSLS, you know, confirm that uh, some leeway in, in that uh, recommendation, any, anything maybe between 200 and 400 uh, microns of elevation different, you know, may, difference may work with an RGP. Uh, Randy's a good friend. And uh, if you haven't seen his 
series on topography on YouTube. I highly recommend them. I've watched them many times uh, over the years. Randy's a true expert in topography. So if you haven't seen those, I would I would urge you to take a look. So this is what Randy and I think Pat Caroline and I think may, maybe Mark Andra, and Andre were involved in. Uh, again, we're going back to axial maps versus elevation maps. You can see the, the, the differences here in the slide. Axial maps are curvature change. Elevation maps are measuring high and low points. So what they did, they took an eight millimeter cord. They they turn turn their their line around to found the area of maximum difference, maximum change, um, and they measured that. And uh, they presented this in 2015 at, at GSLS. And so, you know, what you see here is an elevation difference of uh, 325 microns. The highest point would be 100 microns above the best fit sphere, the lowest point dipping 225 microns below. So your elevation difference was 325, and, and this is how uh, they came up with this, with this number. And they took these patients, they took um, 87 patients, 127 actual lenses, and they fit some with RGPs and some with um, the scleral lenses. And they found that in these patients that had less than 350 microns of elevation difference across the cornea, they had an 88.2% chance of being successful in an RGP. So that's something really, you know, to keep in mind uh, that you can be successful with corneal lenses, even in areas of uh, high astigmatism. Very, very good work uh, from Randy and, and the team. So when do we fit scleral lenses? Okay, let's go, let's go above and beyond, you know, the, the cornea. Well, obviously, the thing we think about mostly is, you know, keratoconus and pellucid marginal generation. Post-penetrating keratoplasty, um, you know, sometimes that is appropriate, and it's quite safe uh, with the cautions that, that we talked about earlier of neovascularization. Uh, Post-refractive surgery, RK, PRK, LASIK. Uh, in my practice uh, in near Houston, Texas, uh, we fit a lot of post-RKs. The uh, ophthalmology community early was very big into RK, and so we saw a lot of uh, post-RK ectasia. Trauma, right? Like the guy, you see the picture on the upper right. I call that bad day at the golf course. Uh, this, this unfortunate guy shanked a golf ball right into his eye and uh, shattered his cornea, his lens, detached his retina. I actually had two graphs shown sewn in and so he you know he had severe trauma obviously and then we have ocular surface disease dry eye disease graft versus host disease is in the bottom uh picture there so very very compromised uh, corneal surfaces so uh, scleral lenses work great not only for vision but protect that corneal surface so yay for sclerals they're comfortable they're stable they, they shouldn't move much if at all long wearing time, maybe all waking hours, although I always caution my patients to take them out an hour before bedtime so that if there is any swelling during the day, which should be minimal, if at all, uh, they would have a chance to de-swell before bedtime. It neutralizes a lot of anterior corneal stigmatism, and they're great for multifocals because you can decenter the optics, you can change the size of the optic zone, um, do all sorts of things. Um, and the landing zone then can be aligned to the scleral shape so that we uh, do have a good fit, a good comfortable fit. Let's spend a minute talking about scleral shape. Uh, this was a very, very good paper in 2017 by Greg Denier and his team analyzing scleral shape. Um, they had um, 100, let's see, 127 um, eyes where they they map these corneas. And so uh, what I want to point out to you is that how ectatic these are, that um, only you know, less than 6% were, had a spherical scleral shape. You know, only, only about 28% were a regular torque shape, meaning, you know, steeper vertically or steeper horizontally and, and across one meridian. 
a lot of them were asymmetric, meaning they may be uh, the steep meridian may be vertical. It may be a with the rule, you know, toric sclera, but the high points would vary by quite a bit. And I, I have a slide of that in a minute. And then uh, a, a very significant portion of them were just highly irregular, where you, the, you know, the the most ectatic regions could be adjacent to each other, nasal and in, in, inferior, so to speak. Um, and so the point is, so many of your patients are uh, highly irregular. You know, may, about a third of them will have something that's that you can fit, you know, in a straightforward fashion. But a big portion of them, more than sixty percent, are highly irregular. So keep that in mind when we start start fitting these lenses and start dealing with some of the the complications of scleral lenses. Uh, again, this is a slide from Greg in the study, and this is what they he terms the asymmetric high and low points. So you can see in the in the map here, the elevation map, it's it's a with the rule sclera. It's steeper vertically and it's flatter horizontally, but the amount of the steep part is 200 microns difference. You know, so if you put a regular torque haptic on this or torque landing zone, you're going to be off 200 microns you know, in one of those meridians. So quite challenging. And so what do we do? Okay, how do we see the unseen? Well, that's where profilometry comes in. Um, the We talked about the sclera being straight and tangent, and that's the slide on the upper right, again, from, from Randy and, and his team. Uh, this is very early. This is a very early map. Uh, there are a variety of profilometers uh, on the market. Most of you have probably run into these uh, or maybe even have some. Um, and then on the bottom right, that was my office uh, in Texas. And I had all the toys, you know, because I, I really enjoyed working with this stuff. And uh, people would come visit and they'd look at all those different instruments and say, oh, Dr. Arnold, that I mean, that's incredible. You have all these all these great things. And I said, yeah, but my car is 15 years old, <laughs> which which is true. I guess I'd rather have the instruments than uh, than, the, than the car. I, I did get a new car, actually, afterwards. So on the profilometers, the, these are common ones that use uh, sodium fluorescein and fluorophotometry. And so uh, if you're using one of these, then I recommend you always have two technicians, two, you know, two people working on your patients. Pre-align the patient, get them all set up, chin rest, height, stool, get them comfortable. The room must be quite dark uh, to use these instruments. And I'd recommend getting a, a real, one of your best techs, someone who's, who's had a lot of experience, and train them and have them be the primary person. If you just get whoever's walking by and they don't do this uh, frequently, I think the results um, may suffer a bit. So get some get get someone who's a primary uh, in your office to do this and practice and practice and practice, uh, and it'll become faster and more comfortable for your patients. So uh, recent studies and not so recent have shown us that um, that tericity starts at the limbus. It's not just on the sclera, all right? So Dottie Fidel uh, and her studies and um, the studies of impression molds by Christine Scent have confirmed uh, time and again that the limbus is oval. Not only is it oval, it's a paraboloid. What's a paraboloid? Uh, it's a Pringles potato chip, okay? So it's oval and it has different high and low points. So what's the significance of that? Uh, one cord is shorter and higher than the other, okay? It's not just an oval, it's an oval with, uh, with height differences. And so that leads to us to, you know, the common experience that, that I know we all have fitting these lenses is you say it aligns well here, but then you have excess clearance. Uh, typically, uh, commonly, I should say, on the in the inferior part. And that leads to, Prolapse, conjunctival prolapse, uh, maybe neovascularization and things and things of that sort. And you can see the illustration, the little fluorescein image, where one meridian severely overlaps uh, the other. A slide from from Dottie's uh, paper, Dottie Fidel's paper, about what happens when your visible vertical iris diameter is shorter than your horizontal visible iris diameter. You overshoot the the vertical limbus when you have a oval 
or a, a spherical uh, optical zone. And this is this is the paper uh, itself. And so what she did was she said, well, you, you can do two different things. You can make an oval optical zone and an oval limbal landing zone, and you can keep the same peripheral um, curve widths, follow those along, and that gives you an oval lens. And that that's not so unusual because um, lots of times the impression molding lenses actually will turn out a, a bit oval. Or you can you can keep the central curves oval and adjust the peripheral curves so that you end up with a spherical lens on the on the outer part. And that's just that's just a different design. They both work pretty much depends on your preference uh, and the you know, how it aligns uh, to that patient's eye and, and what the lab can make for you. Uh, very, very good paper. Dottie is 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 excellent, does a lot of really great work. She's up at Waterloo now uh, using the uh, at heading up the core research team. Now, here's a here's a slide from uh, Justine Siergi. Uh, so some manufacturers give you control over this where you can go on to a uh, tool and specify you know, what your mid peripheral clearance is, what your limbal clearance is in a quad specific matter ma um, pattern, all four areas of the limbal and also the landing zone or what they call the edge. So anything in red in this particular example you see is a negative sign. Negative means we're closer to the cornea, okay? And that's that's a common nomenclature. Plus values are above and in this illustration they're they're shown in green so you can change the orientation you know of the lens how the lens is sitting and you can adjust where the clearance is in each each of these zones so uh manufacturers are now giving you know the practitioner the control of uh, designing the lens in the mid periphery in the limbal zone and the landing zone uh these are some different manufacturers that are that are doing the same thing uh, again, they change the eccentricity of the limbal zone, of the, the landing zone, and then, then the edge. Uh, and you can see on the bottom right, uh, those limbal curves mimic the paraboloid um, uh, design or nature uh, of the lens. So manufacturers are becoming very sophisticated uh, with this. So you say, okay, that's great, Tom, but I don't have uh, all that instrumentation. I don't have a profilometer, uh, and I still want to fit patients. Well, don't despair, because uh, Greg Denier and the same team that they did in the 2017 paper came out with a paper in 2019 uh, where they examined um, all these different um, all these different eyes from two groups. They had kind of the regular prolate. Uh, not so ectatic corneas, and then they had more uh, very, very ectatic corneas. So they had a group A and a group B. Uh, and not surprisingly, the more ectatic group had a more regular scleral shape. Um, and you would expect that. But what's really, really good, the, the take home in this particular paper is that if the height, the most, if the most if the apex of the ectasia, okay, if the most distorted area of the cornea was more than 1.25 millimeters from the center of the cornea, then their scleral shape it was more likely to be much more much more likely to be very ectatic, and you'd probably be dealing not only certainly with a toric landing zone, but probably a quad specific landing zone, or 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 worse, meaning meaning you might need to do. Um, um, impression molding or scan fitting or, or something of that tour, but again, something of that nature. But uh, that is very, very good paper and gives us gives us hope and and some guide about what we're going to encounter when we start putting lenses on those eyes. So torque landing zones, yes, absolutely. If you do it, uh, you got to you got to make a a big enough difference to to make it to make it work, to make it significant. So at least 120 to 180 difference uh, in the two meridians in terms of microns in the landing zone. Uh, many scleras, you know, go up to 300 easily. Um, and in fact, in the Greg Denier study, uh, what they called spherical was um, elevation differences uh, of less than 300. So less than 300 is considered spherical. 
Uh, so everybody has some bit of toric uh, sclera there. Um, larger lenses, as you go farther out, more likely to encounter this. Uh, and so they're more likely to need a torque PC. Um, some labs uh, have fitting sets now that all the all the landing zones are torque in the whole set. So you'll have a good idea of, of what difference uh, there is you know, when you fit that lens uh, and can modify accordingly. Um, a lot of practitioners, a lot of people I know, say it's 80, 95 percent of the time that they've got to fit uh, a toric landing zone or quadrus, quadrant specific landing zone. So that means the majority of your fits are going to be like this. OK, and some some people are so ectatic that you, you have to do an impression on them or do a freeform design. And freeform means from one of those scanners, one of the profilometers, you send the map up um, from the scan and the lab designs a lens and that's called a free form lens and, and most labs will do this now for you. So another little tip for you in trying to assess the haptic and how it's aligning is to use lysamine green. Uh, it's a great tool for uh, assessing uh, haptic alignment. Um, the uh, lysamine is not very viscous and you you know you put it on the put it on the eye and it very quickly is uh, taken up under the haptic so it'll show you where your leaks are uh, um, you know wh where where you're getting you know infusion of of solution underneath uh, you view it in white light this is not a fluorescein uh, and I would tell you that um, I'm, I'm not advocating that these lenses fit snugly and seal off. It's okay to have a little exchange. Uh, I think that's good to flush debris uh, and bring oxygen under the lens. So I'm not I'm not saying it has to be tight, but if you have an area that is is very raised, then you will get a lot of fluid in there, uh, maybe bubble formation or, or midday fogging. So so listening green is is a great tool. So what if you do have your fitting scar lens and the RX does cause uh, call for cylinder uh, in the astigmatism uh, in the prescription? Um, well, first thing to check is most all these lenses decenter, you know, especially in lieu of what we just talked about, how ectatic the landing zones are. So they're going to decenter somewhat. And you can see in these pictures, they can be decentered a lot. And that's going to induce astigmatism. So my rule of thumb on a first lens that I order uh, is to order the spherical equivalent. Because uh, even if the spherical equivalent is um, doesn't give you the, the best vision, in an ectatic eye, it's going to be a lot better than anything else. Um, and if you put a lot of cylinder in the first lens and it decenters and twists, it's going to make the vision a lot worse than a spherical equivalent, in my opinion. So the first lens is often a spherical lens. Uh, and we, when you nail the fit and you center it, uh, all this, and you still have astigmatism uh, coming through and you want to put cylinder in, at least you've got the lens centered uh, and not rotating. And then you can you can put cylinder in square lenses and they work great, but stabilize and center the lens first. Centration is the key. All right. Centration cures a lot of different uh challenges so uh that's that's job number one is is get that lens up upright and centered but i do have a case you know for a torque scleral lens this is one of my early fits actually uh this pa this patient had been a patient of mine for a long time it was an engineer he had he had some some health problems but he was very um vigorous did, did a lot of outdoors outdoorsman stuff hunting fishing uh, definitely had keratoconus, but but not super severe. His daughter had keratoconus. Uh, and as I said, he'd been my patient a long time. So I had him in rigid cone lenses. I had had special sclera, uh, soft lenses for him. Uh, I tried hybrids, didn't work very well. Uh, so along came sclerals. And so I didn't have a profilometer this time. I had a I had a keratometer. Uh, and so I could get the axial maps and I could get the elevation maps, uh, which showed, you know, that typical, you know, kind of low and outside cone. Uh, and that's what I had to work with. And this is a, kind of an early scleral design, uh, a little bit smaller lens. And um, here the curve, the limbal curves were um, 
were irregular. Okay, the limbal curves were in an oval type shape, which helped hug that limbus and, and stabilize the lens. And being a small lens, the outer landing zone, the outer haptic was actually was actually spherical. So uh, not a design we use very much anymore, but it, it worked well for him. You can see the little hash marks. Um, we use an oblate curve, right? And so oblates, of course, are where the central curve is flatter than the peripheral curves. And that induces a, a minus tier layer, a minus uh, tier lens. And in this case, it gave him uh, six diopters of minus power by flattening that central curve. And that's that's a really good trick to know. So you can see that even though his, his prescription was like minus Eight, eight or something, uh, when he came out on this particular lens, it was just kind of a mixed astigmatism, plus and minus. But he did very, very well. Uh, and he loved these, he loved these lenses. So it, it certainly can be done. Typically, you're going to put the um the landing, the the haptic, the the tericity in the outer landing zone or, or the edge. Okay, and that's what we've done here, and I've, I've tried to illustrate it for you. Another thing you can do in terms of pinguecula, and I practice in Texas where the sun sun is is high and a lot of UV, a lot of people had pinguaculas. So you can do something called a um, controlled peripheral recess uh, to get around you know, these obstacles. A recess is different than a notch. A notch is just when you cut into the lens and just make a space, you make a notch, but then you cut into the plastic and the result is an uneven edge. With controlled peripheral recess, you design that right into the lens and it's lathed into the lens when it's manufactured. So it's very reproducible and you uh, get a uniform edge thickness and it too will help stabilize uh, that lens. Works, works very, very well. A couple different slides here. You can just see the, the hash marks uh, uh, there. If you look, look straight to the left uh, on the image on the left, and the one on the right is another controlled peripheral recess. Uh, and you see the markings there for the, for the hash marks. So I hope those uh, kind of help um, illustrate what I'm talking about. I hope, I hope this has been useful for you and got you thinking maybe about some things that uh, uh, you weren't, weren't utilizing before.